I think the church has taken a bad rap over time. You know, there's history with the Catholic Church. Of course, they don't hold all the rights. There's a lot of evangelical scandals as well. And a lot of celebrities, they often have a real impact on the view of how we see the church as well. So there's a popular Christian writer who revealed that he doesn't go to church anymore. He doesn't find it interesting. And maybe a coffee at Starbucks with friends is good enough for him. So the question we wanted to explore today, Evan and I, was why go to church? We thought how suiting for our first anniversary just to kind of step back and ask that question. Maybe a friend has asked this question to you. Maybe you said that question yourself. Maybe you said, why do I need the church today? So maybe at some point you've been hurt by other people. Um, you know, Christian groups, other people have said things, done things. Maybe you were involved in a church at one time. A pastor disappointed you. Someone let you down in some way. And that's real. That happens. Um, maybe you don't find it relevant. So you've gone to church and it's not relevant to your life no longer. You find yourself asking that question again. Why do I need to go to church? I, I have some incredible memories of, of church, but I, like some of you, I have some really bad memories too. So some Christians really act in a way that Christians should never act. Uh, when you've had bad experiences, you start thinking, why church? Why do I want to go to any church? Well, the first time I attended a friend's church, this was many, many years back, uh, but when you've had bad experiences, you start thinking this, well, this is my bad experience. The first time I attended church, people were picketing. Can you imagine? They were picketing. So when I got to the church, on the outside of the building are these people walking around with pickets, you know, and, the, and, the, and I have no idea what they were on strike for because they walked into the church and joined the rest of us for the message and the music. Now, you know how when you have a little girl, a little boy, and you tell them they need to sit down and they'll go, well, I may be sitting down on the outside, but I'm standing up on the inside. These guys literally stood up on the outside. Like, we're talking during the message. So could you imagine three or four people right in front of me and standing up the whole, they were annoying. And I thought, why church? Uh, I, I remember uh, I had another church that I had attended and went with a friend, and they wanted to pray for me. So, you know, like, what's it hurt? Someone wants to pray for you. So they did, and they began to circle around like a pride of lions, like no lie. And they started to roar. Roar! Roar! I thought I was in a, not a cult, an occult. Like, I mean, it was freaky. It was really actually freaky for me. So that's one of the reasons that you got to stop and think, why church? So we are tempted to look at why going to church from a consumer point of view. So you might think, why do I as a consumer need to go to church? Well, Evan loves stats. Anyone that knows Evan knows he loves stats, even if he makes them up. <laughs> he loves them. <laughs> so I thought we could start with some statistics today. These are real stats that I'm going to give you. So the first one, why should you go to church? Because there is significant lower risk of depression. So a University of Saskatchewan study found that the incidence of clinical depression was 22% lower for those who attended church regularly. Wow, hey? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, number two, you'll have a better life and better time management. So another study had uh, found that those who attend church, and by the way, I don't make up statistics, uh, they have a better ability to manage time and to achieve their goals. <laughs> All right, number three. We got better grades and higher education prospects. Wow, hey, did you guys know that? So this study found that church was correlated with better math and reading scores, higher aspirations. In fact, churchgoers are more likely to complete homework. So the parents would like that part, and they're more likely to complete degree programs. <laughs> okay, number four, significantly lower risk of death and longer life expectation. Uh, where's my drummer? No, don't get me wrong. You guys need to know the death rate of Christians is still sitting right at 100%, just like it is for everybody else. But apparently, some live longer than others. See, the study found that those who go to church twice a week actively they live longer than those who go once a week. 
And those who go once a week live longer than those who don't attend church at all. So good news for all of you in here today. Sorry for those on Facebook Live. Uh, but if you've attended church regularly, you're going to be that much more lower risk of death. Now, here's a cool thing. They found that it's a 25% fluctuation difference in that reduction. Ooh. Number five, this one here is the best one. <laughs> they found that Christians have better sex lives. Woo -hoo! Woo! <laughs> so a University of Chicago study known as the most comprehensive and me a methodically sound sex survey ever conducted found dramatically higher rates of the big O in women who attend Woo! church services re religiously. Wow, hey? Um, so that's that, what it says right there. <laughs> that's, that's what, what it says. says. That's, what, that's it what it says. says. I'm reading if the If you back have to there. ask the big O, <laughs> don't ask. <laughs> so then this was echoed by a 1940s survey and Stanford study and a 1970s Red Book magazine study all found higher rates of sexual satisfaction among women who attend religious services religiously. This is cited from an article called Revenge of the Church Lady. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, I think you got to give that one a hand. <laughs> Particularly, I'm speaking to the guys. Come on. So who here thinks that having a happier, healthier, and a better sex life are good enough reasons to go to church? <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I really think we're good. We can go home now. Oh, I, I, I think I got what I and needed. You know, I think actually what we need to do <laughs> is we need to take this now, and we're going to look at maybe a perspective from God's standpoint. So take away that consumer that's kind of fun and it's really good it's but good. yeah so but why church according to the guy who created the universe so there's lots of scriptures out there on why church um, but we're going to base it today on some some verses in Hebrews 10 23 24 and 25 we're going to pull out three principles about why church from God's viewpoint so just before we go there, I, I just want to talk a little bit about the book of Hebrews. Does anyone know who the author of Hebrews is? Nobody does. It's an anonymous book. Uh, the, best, the, the best estimate is approximately it came 35 years after Jesus had died. Now, I want you to think about this. Let's unpack this for a moment. It was a crazy time in the world. Nero was the emperor. He burned Rome down, literally, and he blamed it and used the Christians as scapegoats. And then he had them burned to death, as an example. Now, I want you to think about this during this time when the book of Hebrews is written and what the manuscript is saying. Because, because of this incredible persecution that is happening, Christians were crucified absolutely everywhere. In fact, both Paul and Peter, they were martyred right before the manuscript was actually written. But what they didn't know it what was going to happen in the next two years. Life would change completely. Jerusalem is going to be wiped out. The temple, gone. Everything would be totally destroyed in just two years. Now, have you ever looked at our world today? It's pretty crazy time in, in our world. Just look around this planet. You'll see it. Don't you agree? We live in a bit of a crazy time. Just lift your hand if you think it's a bit of crazy. And don't point it at the person beside you. That's not what we're talking about. And that's why we thought this might be a really good message to share on why church. So let's start by reading Hebrews 10 and verse 23. We're going to pull our first principle from this one. Let us, let's read it together with me. One, two, three. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. So Evan explained the context of that verse about holding tightly to unwavering hope in a really difficult time. So their lives were just out there. They were crazy. They were given these instructions. So we're going to take these same instructions today from these scriptures. And I'm going to give you the first God perspective on why church? Because Jesus died for it. Jesus yeah. died for the church. So we just read verse 23, and it talks about the hope that we affirm. So what do you think that hope is? It says there's a hope that we need to affirm. So here is the hope I want you to think about. That Jesus died, he was buried, he rose again, so that we could have eternal life. No matter what difficult situation that you're facing right now, 
It might be great. Your life might be really great right now, but you might not, it might not actually be that great right now too. So, but if you're commit, have you have made that decision to commit your life to Jesus, you can actually lay your head down at night in peace, knowing that if you don't wake up tomorrow, that you're going to wake up in eternity with God. You know, I just want to back up a few verses here because it really amplifies the same hope that he was talking about. Let's go back and look now in Hebrews 10, verse 19 and 20. And then it says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter, boldly enter, you get this, boldly enter into heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. That means because of what Jesus has done for us. And it says, though, by his death, Jesus opened a new and a life-giving way. He opened up a new way, and it was a life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. The real point now that is being declared in this scripture, Jesus died so we can have access to God. That's the whole purpose here, is so that you can have access, so you're no longer separated. See, I was speaking with someone from another country, and we were having this conversation about the church, and then we started talking about Canada. Oh, Canada, they were amazed by the celebration of our Canadian celebration of July 1st. Now, I was surprised because they don't hold large national celebrations in their home country. They may have had some form of celebration, but not to the extent that we have here in Canada. You know, we get the parades, we get the hot dogs, the fireworks. Uh, We get everyone wants to celebrate July 1st and with pride. But I never really thought about this before. And so I began thinking more really about this. And I think we know this. People die because they believed in a freedom. On Remembrance Day, we honor those who gave their lives so that we can have our freedoms. Mm -hmm. And that's why we celebrate on Canada Day. Now, I might be crazy when I look at our flag. I don't think what's wrong with Canada. I just don't. When I look at our flag, I think about the people who died for it, who gave us our celebration and the freedoms that we have today. I think about those people. And when I look at the church, I don't think about what's wrong with the church. When I look at all of what's happening, there's plenty wrong with Christianity. But instead, I think about who died for the church so that I can experience freedom, that you can experience that freedom. And that same way that Jesus died so we can be free Jesus died so we can be one with God. And we can't ever, ever forget that. So we're going to go and look now at a scripture in Ephesians 5. And it says, for husbands, this means love your wives, just as Christ loved the church. He gave up his life for her. So he loved the church. He gave up his life for her. So this is a comparison of love between husbands and wives. It compares the love of Jesus that he has for his church, which they use the symbolism of the bride. So basically on the surface, it says Jesus died for the church. So you can't separate Jesus and the church. You just can't love Jesus and not love his bride. You you know, uh, just kind of bring this home a little bit. Years ago, I remember one guy and he didn't like my wife. He didn't like Mary Lou. And that's really an irony because everybody loves Mary Lou. Me, that's a different story. (laughs) Loudmouth Evan, right? But anyway, anytime I tried to get together with him and his wife and involve Mary Lou, he just kept making these excuses, and and he just, it it just wouldn't work for him. It didn't turn out. And he kept saying things like, you know, she's kind of cold. She's a little distant. You know, has she gone through some struggles in her past? And I finally realized he just didn't like my wife problem is you can't like me and talk bad about my wife I'm gonna say that again you can't like me and talk bad about my wife it's a package deal you can't have one of us without the other it's the same with Jesus you can't love Jesus and talk bad about his bride the church Mm -hmm. maybe Christianity but not the church so Gandhi was a man who was instrumental in liberating, um, bringing freedom to India. And Gandhi was a Hindu man, and he had a very famous quote that he said about Christians. He said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. 
So he was saying that Jesus is okay, but I got a real problem with those Jesus followers. Over the years, I could actually kind of agree with him sometimes when I think about it. I've met some really, really squirrely Christians. Um, Stop pointing up there. I saw that. (laughs) So some people, you just have to love them by faith, right? They might do weird and embarrassing things. We're all very different, right? And that might be why Gandhi said, I like your Christ, but I don't like your Christians. So here's the challenge that I have with that saying. Gandhi and others, even popular people in in this culture, they want an image of what Jesus is, not the real Jesus. Because if you study the real Jesus, Jesus, he calls sinners to repentance. He claimed to be the son of God and he died for our sins. If the church is the bride of Christ, you can't separate Jesus and the bride. You can't say, I love Jesus and I don't love the church. You you know, I'm actually kind of weird. Um, (laughs) Okay, that didn't come out right. Well, see, I like to go to church when I'm on vacation. Uh, And I'm not saying that to maybe put anybody else down that's here because you don't. Actually, maybe you shouldn't go. That should be just a time off that just you're relaxing. But I just do, and I just go all the time. And I, I love to see what other churches are doing. Uh, I like to go to churches of different cultures, different styles. But the reason I do is I just really want to see what's going on in the churches around the world, especially places that are not close to us when we travel to other countries. Uh, and I just find that I want to see things that they're doing that are different from me. Because Jesus died for the church, and I'd love to see what people are doing in his church in different cities and towns. Why church? Why prioritize a few hours every weekend? Because Jesus died for it. That's why. He died for the church. But it's also for another reason. It's because you are a necessary part of it. You are a necessary part of the church. Now, let's look at 1 Corinthians 12, 27. This is what I believe Paul would say to Elevate Church today if he was standing here with us. All of you together are Christ's body. And you ready? Each of you is a part of it. (laughs) Each of you is a part of it. Every single one of you is a part of Elevate Church in some way. Everyone here, you're all important. Your service is essential to the body, which means the church Each of you has a role to play, and every role is important. There's no such thing as a small service. It all matters. So I thought, tried to think about, Evan and I were chatting about, what could we illustrate this to help bring this home a little bit better? So I started with, I started to think about a chandelier that I have over my kitchen table. Um, it broke a few weeks ago and I did have a picture of a broken one but uh, I lost that Um, so my son wonderful son-in-law Tom came and fixed it for me so it is fixed now so what I found out though when this light was broken is I would say that this light is probably the most visible light in my house Um, and so when you walk in you're probably going to see it first is it necessarily the most important light in my house if I could actually manage to go without it for two weeks? <laughs> so I love big fancy lights, don't get me wrong. In fact, I'm trying to convince Evan to let me buy a bigger one, a more visible one. See my new chandelier I want? Um, so how many of you agree here that Evan should let me buy this new chandelier for my house? Yeah! <laughs> so Davina, she told me when I showed her this picture, she said that I didn't need this light. And of course, she's taking these courses through Dave Ramsey and <laughs> financial and all of these these kind of things. She's saying, mom, you don't need that light. (laughs) And I thought this is maybe a good opportunity to plead my case, that I think maybe this light would look good in my house. But both Evan and Davina said it wasn't really necessary. Okay. I actually have a different (laughs) idea of the most important light in the house. It's not all that visible. Can we have the lights off in the house? (laughs) Now, this light prevents me from stubbing my toe when I get up at night. If I didn't have this light, it would spell certain injury for me. How many of you might agree with me that this might be the most important light in the house? Oh, it looks like I got to get a chandelier. For some of you, for some of you, it might not be a little night light. It might be your dark closet. You need a light. It might be somewhere over the freezer. 
Uh, they're all important. Some are just more visible, right? Some different lights than others. And really what Paul is saying here to the church is it's the same way. Some of us in the church are more visible than others. Some We're all equally important. We're all part of that puzzle. So a healthier church is where everyone does what God's created them to do. So whether you're more visible or not visible, it's really about doing what you're called to do and your gifts. So everybody serving. So today, often what can happen in the church is it's hockey season in the church, Woo! right? <laughs> so if you watch hockey, there's going to be 19 players on, on that ice, and they're in desperate need of rest. And they're being watched by 18,000 people in desperate need of exercise. So this is not how it should be. This is not how the church should be. So I think about the phrase, where do you go to church? And I'm a member of a church, not a country club. So it's not where you go, but where you plant your flag. And then you say, this is where I'm going to be a Christian. This is where I'm going to serve. You know, can I just say this to everybody today? If God has led you to this church, you might say, well, well, how do I know if God has led me? Well, I just want to let you know he just did. Yep. <laughs> he kind of set everything up, all this kind of sort of stuff. You know, some of you, you were asked to come. You happened to find us online. Circumstances in life just changed. But you're here today. So if God has led you to this church, I challenge you to get planted, to plant your flag. We need you. Whether you're a great big chandelier light like Mary Lou likes, <laughs> or if you're one of those small but enough, uh, uh, enough light to be able to see around in the dark of the night to prevent injuries, uh, if you're up on a stage, or if you're in behind the scenes where no one sees you, you're out in the cold, uh, it doesn't matter where you serve. We need you. We need everybody. So, you ask, how do we get involved? Well, I'm so glad you asked me. <laughs> we have something called Next Steps. I know that's just a shameless plug. <laughs> and so I want to encourage you, if you want to get into God's purpose, his design, find your way to kind of plant your flag into this church, that's a great opportunity. You can just sign up by filling out one of those connection cards. So I'm going to bring us back now. We're going to go back to that Hebrews verse that we're basing a lot of this um, scripture out of. This helps us understand why we are a necessary part. So in Hebrews 24, it says, let us think of ways to motivate one another, to acts of love and good works. So I love that it says thinking. You were trying to think of ways to motivate one another. That's amazing. So can you imagine with me, imagine a church full of people, instead of complaining about what they don't like, like I don't like the music, it's too loud, it's too slow, it's too old, it's too new. Air conditioning isn't right, it's too warm, it's too cold. I wish that they had better coffee. Why? Maybe they should have Starbucks or maybe they should have Tim's. Uh, I, I know it doesn't happen here, yeah. but it does happen yeah. in other churches. That's right. <laughs> but I want you to stop in all seriousness and just imagine a church Instead of complaining about what they don't like, they're thinking up ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. That's the church that Jesus died for. So why church? Why prioritize an hour every Sunday? Because Jesus died for it and because you are a necessary part of it. And I'm going to give you one last reason. Number three is the times we live in demand it. Because the times we live in, they demand that we're part of that church. So let's read the third verse in the Hebrew scripture. It's Hebrews 25. Now, it says, let us not give up the habit of meeting together. 
as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage one another all the more, since you see the day of the Lord is coming nearer. So this is the verse that pulls it all together. This is the verse that um, is going to give us some real context about this is what God says. He says, don't stop meeting together. Don't lose that habit. And Evan's going to explain a little bit later about the day of the Lord, when the day of the Lord is coming. Um, the first century church, they started strong. And Evan gave you a little bit of that history. And they were excited to be gathered together. They were doing it regular, and it was part of their routine. But then some people were not doing it anymore. And that's why this scripture is in there, right? Don't stop doing it. Maybe sometimes they didn't because of persecution. You know it really was a terrible time then. So similar to what the Iraqi Christians are facing right now. Like that, that's a persecution, not anything that we would ever understand. It could be because of persecution that these people quit going to church, quit meeting together, it says. So however... There is some other likely reasons I was thinking about. So some, it might be a busy schedule. Some, it was just not important. It wasn't relevant and not important. So doesn't that sound a little bit like today? <laughs> so the Bible says you got to be meeting together. you got to do it. So the term meeting together, you might say, what's that really mean? Tell me what does that mean? Because it actually doesn't refer to three friends getting together at Starbucks. So that's not what the scripture refers to. It actually refers to the formal gathering of people for worship. That's what it means when you take that context. So there is a writer, Justin Miter, was a writer in the second century. And he described what the early church service might look like. So I'm going to read that for you. It says, on the day called Sunday, all who live in the countryside and in the city gather together for worship. So they, um, the writings of the Poth apostles or prophets are read as scriptures and then the president or the pastor <laughs> applies them to everyday life and then we stand and offer prayers and sing bread wine worship together and then there's a response time that, that really sounds similar to today even though this was the second century and they even had a response time at the end yeah. Do you notice that i love that that's so cool uh, I, I just want to talk briefly about what does when we read that scripture it says the day what does that refer to in Scripture? It says, when we meet, do it even more as the day approaches. So what it's doing is it's actually, at that point, it's referring to a few things. One of the things it's referring to is an impending mortality. The day we die and we meet Jesus, we become accountable for our lives and how we've lived previously. In other words, you need to live like you're dying. Yeah. You guys catch that? You need to live like you're dying. Because we live different when we know we've only got 24 hours or six months or one year. That's why we need the church more than ever. But it's also talking about a coming physical disaster. Jesus speaks to his disciples right before he leaves. He tells them what's going to be happening. He lets them know he's coming back. And he tells them to prepare. Again, this reference, we need each other. Uh, we need the church more than ever to really keep each other sharp in this coming time. Uh, many of us, we're never gonna, gonna forget 9-11 or many of the school shootings, some that have hit closer to home for some of us. We have never been more aware of our mortality and our vulnerability personally and as a country than when those events have occurred. And sometimes we get away from that and we just forget that we live in a crazy world. Are we in the end times as the Bible refers to the end of the world? I don't know. Maybe but what I do know is there's much happening that we need each other and we desperately need his church. So the question is, why church? Because Jesus died for it, because you are a necessary part of it, and because the times demand it. We are in a crazy world. So I want to conclude. Do you know what it means when a pastor says they want to conclude? It means nothing. Nothing. But today, <laughs> it actually means something. Uh, go ahead, Jen. Uh, we want to take a few minutes to actually talk about why we actually love 
Elevate Church. Yeah. So we actually took some time to ask some of you, some of people out there, some of you might have got my little message that said, tell me why you love Elevate Church. Because I thought, what better than to reflect on what it is that people might actually love about our church. So I'm going to read a few words that were written and sent to me. Okay. Go ahead. I love the people. How hard everyone is working. I am so impressed with what others give. Love the atmosphere that we've created. The welcoming, open, and fun. Friendly people. Love our welcoming hearts. Open arms, even when we can't agree. I love our heart for those who don't know Jesus. Love that preaching. It includes Jesus. (laughs) Everyone helps one another out. Uh, Belonging. The idea of belonging even before believing. Uh, Love people's passion for God. Love that it's more about serving our Father and others. I love the close-knit style community. I love being the drummer and being able to teach big kids. Well, that one wasn't obvious. (laughs) Uh, I love our location. I love the theater. I love the opportunity to find your gift and helping others. Love talking to people, especially the young people. Love that we like to have fun. Love the family atmosphere. The great child care that I don't have to feel worried about them. The people are caring and they always stop to say hello. And my favorite one is what I love most is what is yet to come. What will be produced by the people of Elevate Church? Love that one. (laughs) You know, we're on a journey here today. We're talking about something that's living and it's alive and that is impacting our lives every day, whether we know it or we don't. You see, when you haven't been in a church, you haven't been planted, there's somebody that's been praying for you in a church because they love you. They care about you. Your life matters. And so you may be here today, and I'm not sure where your relationship is with God, but we want to invite you to journey with us. Maybe you're one of those people that say, you know, I, I, I like to belong, but I'm not sure I, I really believe. And that's okay. We invite you just to put your flag down and join us in this journey. And maybe you're here today and you actually believe that today is that day and you're wanting to make that decision. We're going to pray a prayer just in a few moments so that you can allow Jesus to lead your life and to know that you are with this man who died for you and died for this church. And you might be here for two months and six months, and maybe you've been with us since the very beginning with the launch team a year ago. But I want to encourage you to put your flag down, to plant that flag. We talked about in friending how you need to get deep roots so you can reach, can go broad. That's exactly what you need to do. And so my challenge to you is let's reach by planting ourselves and getting connected today. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we have this incredible opportunity to journey together as a community, as a family, as an army, as a team. But most of all, with you, Jesus, as your friend. Thank you for calling us friends. We honor you. And Father, I just pray today that today would be the day, God, that I'm giving you everything that I've done wrong in my life and the, the, the mindsets that I've had, the wrong attitudes I've had, and I'm pushing them aside. And I'm asking you, Jesus, to lead my life. Forgive me for everything that I've done. I thank you. And Lord, I just pray for those here today. They've been discouraged. They've been depressed. And they've left the church. They're connecting. They're growing. Some have been in the church, but they're not sure if they want to step out because of the pain that they've experienced. But Father, I ask today that you would remove that pain and that you would give them faith and that hope, God, that tomorrow will be better because the best is yet to come. Because the best is yet to come. And so, Father, we thank you for everything you're doing. In Jesus' name. And everybody together, amen. Amen. Give God a hand.